Okay, well, thank you um, for joining me. Um, everyone, this is uh, <coughs> Sunday, um, <clears throat> and she is the uh, founder and owner of Oli Kraut, a local um, sauerkraut and probiotic company here in Olympia, a certified benefit corporation, um, and a, an Evergreen uh, State College alum who has gone on to do some pretty incredible things. So we're very lucky to have you in the room today, Sash. Um, and I am going to hand it off to you to give your, you know, give a, a brief introduction, um, and also to um, I'm ask the first question to get us started of. You know, for those who don't know Ollie Kraut, what's one of your favorite ways to describe what you do and what your company does? Okay, so, <clears throat> so I guess I'll start with the, in, the first question was about my history at, with, with Evergreen. Um, so leading up to Evergreen, I did a lot of different things um, and had <clears throat> lived in a few different places and was actually, I was working as a mechanic <clears throat> and started to think more about being healthy and working around all of the chemicals. And so I decided to go, I was really excited about vegetables and farming and gardening. And so I went, I decided to go back to Evergreen and study food and sustainable agriculture. <clears throat> and so that was what brought me to Evergreen. I'd already um, been to college in different ways, but never finished my degree and trade school. Um, so anyway, that brought me to Evergreen and I started in the food program, which was amazing. And I did a focus on fermentation in, in the third quarter where we did independent projects um, and was just very excited about it all um, and had started also working on an organic farm in uh, Rochester about the same time. And so had ended up with a bunch of cabbage because of the farm and had made my first, first batch of sauerkraut. Um, which was amazing. And, um, or at least I thought so. I'd never had raw sauerkraut before. And <clears throat> I just got really fanatical. So I was very excited about fermentation. The more I learned about it, the more I realized and just discovered that there's so much going on and in, a, in an active fermented food, a functional fermented food, and, and incorporating that into my life as I was shifting away from or just shifting into being more healthy and thinking about food and where everything comes from and how we treat our bodies. So that was sort of where I was at when I started Evergreen and it was amazing and everything there fell right into place. Basically the food program um, blew my mind. And then I did the sustainable, what was called the practice of sustainable agriculture at the time. I know the name has changed. I can't remember what it is. Um, and that was great. And on the farm, I actually was able to grow everything to make and sell sauerkraut and kimchi um, at the farm stand. And we got that all organically certified. And then we had a business plan assignment at the end of that uh, program. And I wrote the first business plan for Oli Kraut and we launched before I graduated. So um, very helpful evergreen education there. Um, and. Uh, and I literally had just done everything that I needed to do to run that business at Evergreen on the farm. So that was extremely helpful. Um, and I very much wanted to have that business because I cared about, like one of my values is really health and thinking about the food system in general and how it is not like the, to, if you just go about your business in this country, it's very easy to eat foods that are extremely unhealthy and not only hurting you, but, uh, but hurting the environment because of how they're processed or how they're sold. Um, and so kind of figuring all of that out and understanding what I wanted to see and then thinking about how if I had a business, I could have a bigger impact by participating in the economy I wanted to see happen. Um, and, uh, and that's true. And so every year that we've been in business, we've been able to buy more local produce. Uh, one of our big priorities is um, buying from farms in our region to sort of re-regionalize the food system, which I think is important for a lot of things. I mean, I think just having a healthy local economy with lots of different kinds of businesses functioning is really critical, but also specifically in food and spreading around in the Pacific Northwest, especially on the West side, we can grow a ton of food here and we absolutely should be because as things, I mean, honestly, COVID gave us a really good example of what could happen when the supply chain hits a uh, snag. Um, and I, I was really heartened to see the Olympia Food Co-op shelves. I mean, they were having trouble 
with some of the like canned beans and toilet paper and stuff like that, which we're not making so much here in Olympia, but like everything else was there. And that's because they have made a concerted effort to purchase directly from local suppliers and really developed that as a part of their business model. And it has built up our regional economy and our food system in a way that is truly remarkable. And I'm so grateful to be a part of that. Um, but anyway, I'm maybe rambling off a little bit, but that was my experience at Evergreen. After Evergreen, uh, so I started Holy Crow before I graduated. I think I graduated officially in 2009, started Holy Crow in 2008. Chugged along for a while. We did Enterprise for Equity, which is a really great nonprofit here in town that helps low-income entrepreneurs develop their business plans. And so I had two business partners when we started and I had written the business plan because I started it before we all connected and like, actually formed the business. So doing enterprise for equity together with my business partner eventually was useful for us to do that together. Um, and then after a few years, she left the both of the other two people moved on to other things. Um, I eventually got my MBA at um, what is now called Presidio, uh, which is a pretty great program. I did it when it was BGI up on Bainbridge Island, um, and, and it was awesome. I got a lot out of that. And, um, and my degree, I think it's a, it's an MBA in sustainable systems. And I got a certificate in food and agricultural systems. Um, so it sounds like I'm right in line with this program. <laughs> um, it's cool that everyone is thinking about this stuff. Um, and yeah, so I've been checking along with that. The MBA helped a lot. I had done you know, I came to this because I liked food and making sauerkraut, not because I was like, I'm going to be a business owner. And so it took me a lot just to get to the point where I was like, it's okay to be a business owner. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then beyond that to like, oh, and we should actually try to make money. Still kind of working on that. But, um, but they're like my yeah, it's only like a values based business and it shows in how the business does, but um, but that's also a work in process. And I believe that that is a good business strategy and can be, and certainly we can get into that. Um, and then just like, what is Oli Kraut? I mean, if you haven't figured it out by now, it's a sauerkraut company um, here in Olympia. Uh, we source as much local ingredients as we can. Um, we package everything in glass. We do not ferment in plastic. Um, and I'm the owner, we're, so we're woman owned. We are a B Corp, as you mentioned. Um, we've won a bunch of awards. We, you know, employ a bunch of people in town. Uh, we're really working hard, more specifically since this last year on uh, figuring out how to work equity and justice into what we do and like mm -hmm. using whatever platform we do have because we are a business to uh, hopefully move forward equity and justice, particularly in the food system, but anywhere that we can. Um, yeah, so does that pretty much answer the first question? <laughs> Fantastic. Um, I have sort of a follow-up question um, on that. You know, a lot of our, a lot of students, a lot of young people are, um, are scared to take the step into being entrepreneurs because of sort of the risk associated with it. Um, so my, my question, my question is twofold is, is one were, are, you know, what were some of the challenges that you faced, um, you know, getting Oli Kraut off the ground? Um, and also, uh, what would you, how would you respond to a question along risk um, when it comes to young people wanting to become entrepreneurs? Yeah, I don't know. Um, I think it was ignorance that got me this far, or at least far enough that I couldn't go back. Um, I just didn't, I was like, I guess I'll start a business. I don't know. I just keep making the sauerkraut. I can't stop. Um, and so <clears throat> by the time it just, it, I mean, it, like, I don't think a lot of businesses start that way. Some do. And I feel kind of lucky that I did. Cause I don't know if I had critically used a lot of critical thinking, I would have made, I would have done this. Um, Cause it is risky. Like I, and I have actually been thinking about that specifically risk tolerance quite a bit lately and just like the degree of stress that I am comfortable with now and therefore live with and sort of generate <laughs> because it's what I'm used to is like potentially not healthy. And so it's like, but I don't know if, you know, it's hard to own a small business and not be comfortable. You have to take risks and you have to live with a lot of 
insecurity and unknowns and um especially look i mean look at what happened in 2020 like with so many businesses it's terrifying like i'm very grateful that our uh sector it, you know as food manufacturers we were pretty consistent it's more inconvenient for sure and there was challenges like with supply chain but we were able to continue working and we had continued demand for the product which is really good you get help it it helps your immune system i hope that people are putting that together but um but yeah, so I don't know, like the way we started, also I think I'm just like inherently like, I don't think I'm inherently like risk tolerant. I think that I have, um, I'm not a conservative person, but I think when it comes to risk, I was, I'm practical. So when we started, we didn't take on debt and we just started really small and we like, there were three of us. So we each put in $30 really living on the edge there and bought some candy jar like uh, bell jars ball jars basically and um some cabbage and made, started making crowd at home and selling it out of a fridge in one person's yard on the west side and so totally illegal totally illegal but you know it was like just to friends and neighbors and we started with that and and just tried every recipe we could think of and we're just doing all kinds of things and then we developed a little csa model we called it a css community supported sauerkraut and through that we were able to start honing in on the recipes that people liked like we saw what people were buying over and over again and that helped us um, with product development it gave us a good customer base to get started with um, and by the time I had, you know, written the business plan, I was like, I think we can do this. Um, we were kind of looking for a kitchen because you can't, mm -hmm. yeah. you need a certified kitchen to sell a food product. And there's some cottage laws around now, but I don't think they cover fermented food. So um, that was the big barrier. But we ended up getting really lucky and finding a place where it had been empty. So they were just happy to have someone there and she was willing to give us a staggered rent. And so we negotiated. And and that uh, gave us the opportunity to get started with like no money up front basically because she understood it was like we couldn't sell until we had um <clears throat> a space sorry to get a space we don't have money from selling so there's that problem um i obviously a lot of people just take loans or save up money so that they can get that initial launch and also i apologize if you can hear the piano someone downstairs is playing the piano <laughs> um, <laughs> accompaniment. Um, so, uh, um, but yeah, so I guess it's like, I, I don't love the, um, just like the assumption that all entrepreneurs are super, uh, like just take risks willy nilly and are all about like big, gamble like I that is a hundred percent not true for me and I and I really think it's why we're still here we were very frugal like we operated extremely I mean we still operate really scrappily um and and the bigger we get the more close to the bone that you operate the higher stress and risk and like you know there's like just so much more to lose when things don't go right as you get bigger so it's like it would be you know the plan is that as we get bigger also we will start having more abundance and it will be helpful and awesome and so but um as but it's just not always like that and so yeah you have to kind of be able to handle that and, and also don't be a dummy like <laughs> plan <laughs> like use the tools that you will learn in this class probably and various things and like think about cash flow and think about contingency plans because things totally will go wrong and um and build your community because like i can't tell you how many times we've like made it through something hard because we had like awesome community who stepped up and gave us a small loan or traded us a food processor for some sauerkraut or you know like things like that yeah i love this idea too um that entrepreneurship is not just those who are born inherently with this this trait right that entrepreneurship is for anyone and everyone. Um, and there's a variety of skills that you need to learn um, along the way. But just because you're not inherently a risk taker, you know, I'm not either, doesn't mean you can't be a successful entrepreneur. Um, right. And I mean, I've even met a lot of people that I think just are like, 
I'm an entrepreneur and they'll have like business after business and they're all just fail. So it's like, cool. Like that's great. And they're still probably like getting, like that's the life they want to live. And that is actually what we should all be doing. But like, <laughs> but sometimes I'm like, uh. <laughs> well, it, also, it also brings up this idea. And this is an idea that we've talked about in, in our classroom all the time, this idea of quantitative growth versus qualitative growth, right? So, and they're very different narratives. Um, you know, one is inherent in the, the market that, that, you know, the, the global market that we know and sort of the narrative that we're born of, the quantitative growth. But on the other hand, qualitative growth, um, you know, is linked to better quality of life, better community, stronger, you know, local economies and networks. Um, and it sounds like that, you know, that's perhaps the, the way that you're going, which is fantastic. Oh. Definitely, yes. <laughs> okay. um, well, my next question is, um, you know, why was it important? Well, the first is, is when you first incorporated as a business, um, was the B Corp um, structure there as a legal or incorporation? Did you incorporate as an LLC and then move to get certified as a B Corp? So, um, so B Corp's not a legal structure, but I, and I can explain that in a second, but we are, we started as an LLC. <clears throat> which is an awesome business entity type to use. If you're getting started, it's the most flexible, pretty much does everything you need. I have, I, I would advise that unless you're really clear on some other down the road thing, because it is annoying to change and we did have to change, but I still feel like the LLC served us for the time that we were an LLC. So that's great. Um, but changing is a pain. And the longer you wait, the more of a pain it becomes. Um, so we became uh, we are a we are an SPC now, which is Washington State's C Corp. That is the beneficial version, and S, the SPC stands for Social Purpose Corporation. So basically, in the eyes of the IRS, we're just a C Corp. So like that's how we file our taxes, and that's how they think about us. But in the state of Washington, there's this additional clause in our articles that that says like when we make our decisions, we're going to take fiduciary responsibility into consideration, but also our impact on the humans and the planet, like the social and environmental impacts, and that we reserve the right to do that. And so that way, should we have a board in the future who maybe someone would be like, well, you're going to make so much more money if you stop buying organic ingredients. We want you to do that. We can say like, well, no, we're legally doing this because of these reasons. And that's and that's cool. And so um, that is the legal legal entity for Washington State that you would need to have to be a B Corp if you're a corp. If you can, you can be an LLC and be a B Corp at the same time. We were, and that's fine. Because in an LLC, you're writing your articles. They're very, um, you have to have a clause in there that sort of conveys that same language. But um, but yeah, it's not a, there's not like a comparable LLC entity type in Washington state. So they're just like, fine, just put it in your articles. Right. Okay, great. And B Corp, um, you know, for, for people who are watching this um, is a certification process. And I think under the law of C Corp, you have to have sort of a third party, almost auditor organization to ensure that you're meeting that sort of triple bottom line and B Corp sits as that auditor organization, correct? Yeah, B, yeah, well, yeah, so the Washington State SPC, to be an SPC, there are some rules and, and basic, they're not, um, there's no uh, third party auditor for those, you just have to do them and they involve um, publicly stating how, like what your mission is and how you are achieving it on an annual basis. Um, and so B Corp certification is way more rigorous and that's a third, yeah, it's basically a third party certifier for triple bottom line businesses. Um, triple bottom line business means that you're considering your social and environmental impact as well as profitability in your business decisions. Um, and so the B Corp certification, like the entity B Corp is, um, it's, it's like a standalone org. <clears throat> and then, and then just depending on which state you are, like how to comply, it, it's like slightly different in terms of legal types. And so I do think that beneficial corp is an entity type in multiple states, but here we just call it SPC or whatever. Yeah. We're still B Corp certified. It's, it is confusing. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but it is also very rigorous and you have to like, uh, 
recertify every three years and uh, there's a minimum, uh, they, they break it up into basically like social, environmental, and then like business into three categories. Um, and then within those, there's quite a bit of detail, like with the social, there's like, how do you treat your employees, but how do you engage with the community and your customers or whatever. Um, <clears throat> and so you fill out, like there's a, a very in-depth questionnaire and then you have to support all of your answers with actual data reports. Um, so you have to figure out how to collect data and report it. Um, some of that is more challenging than others. Um, the process itself is extremely helpful, I found, in actually, it's like making official all of the stuff that you believe. Like we started the business very much from a, from the place of an environmentalist and like somebody wants to take care of people and also human health and like all these things. But it is really easy to just like get caught up in the making of the sauerkraut and paying the bills. And so it to like sit down and like figure out exactly what are the numbers that you're accomplishing and how do you want to make those better and what will that impact be and like write it all out and figure out how to report on that is actually really helpful. Um, and then there's also stuff like policies for your employees that you can get points for um, that are really cool. And maybe like, you know, we hadn't necessarily thought of all of that before we went through the certification process. So we became a better business as a result of the certification. And it was <laughs> Well, it's um, it's also good for our for our students to hear that um, these things matter, right? That um, not only does the legal structure matter, matter, but the types of tools that you're using within the business itself, um, those things have, have power and importance not only for tracking what you're doing, but also leading you to new places, which is a strategic thinking um, and, and steering the business, if you will. Um, that's great. Well, you sort of mentioned some of, um, I want to go through um, some of the social components of your business. So you mentioned that it's um, woman owned and woman operated um, and that, uh, you know, you're all about healthy, healthy people, healthy gut biome. Um, can you talk a little bit more about sort of the social component? Um, sure. I would say that we're, we're woman owned and I would think, I think the whole, as much of the gender spectrum as is available to operate it is operating it. Um, and so, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Um, and, but yeah, we have, uh, like between 16 and 18 employees kind of fluctuates depend on farmer's market and stuff like that. Um, and so we try to treat them as well as we can. We have a pretty elaborate handbook at this point that is like, you know, we add things every year. We've been around for 13 years. Um, but I really try, like, I really like lean, some of the philosophy of lean manufacturing, um, specifically the part where often the best ideas about how to actually do things come from the people who actually do them, not necessarily the person sitting in the office. Um, and so we try to remind people of that and, and make it as easy as possible for people to have input um, and really build that into the operation. And it's a work in process. It's like hard to do that. This year has actually been kind of cool. Nobody could leave on tour we had a really solid crew for the whole time. And so like, there's been some upsides to COVID. And so it's like made people uh, just like know how to work together really well. Um, and that's been a kind of nice side effect because uh, we do hire a lot of artists and musicians and, and the flexibility is part of one of the perks because we also don't make a ton of money. So we can't pay everybody as much as we would like. We do pay more than the minimum wage. Our, our minimum wage in 2021 is 1450. Um, which I want to be higher and I campaigned for the higher minimum wage in Washington state and I'm completely on board and we're just uh, baby stepping our way there and doing mm -hmm. the best we can. Um, yeah, so that's how we do that. And then as far as uh, we developed a, a small business pledge to being anti-racist in the last year. And um, through that, we have decided to focus on where we spend our money. And so I, we have a survey that we're sending out to all of our vendors to like a demographic survey basically so we can understand how many businesses are we currently supporting or like paying money for our stuff um, who are like uh, black or indigenous or other people of color owned. Um, we're also paying attention to whether or not they're women or LGBTQ and like trying to get data on that. So then we can set targets to keep doing better and just like being spreading the money around the community as much as possible to the extent that we can. Um, 
And then there's the part where we focus on buying from local farms before further away so that we can build that up. And the other bonus is those local farms are ones that we can like visit and know the people and know that they're treating the workers well. And that's important as well. Um, yeah, and then we're just, I don't know. I think those are the primary business things that we do and then just try to be like nice people. <laughs> awesome. Um, can you also talk a little bit more about some of the environmental components? So you've mentioned that um, your ingredients are all organic um, and that, you know, underneath that there are concepts of regenerative agriculture um, that are inherent in organic movement. Yeah, so yeah, we are all organic and I do actually think that that's a, a worthwhile certification at this point. Nothing is perfect and there's a, you know, everything's always improving, but there's no other um, standard really uh, that it would ensure that a baseline of limitation on destruction to our soil and water is happening. Um, so anyway, yeah, that's why we wanna pre preserve our resources. It's also a little safer for the humans involved um, and yeah, but um, so there's that and we compost everything and we have a pretty efficient facility. We try to keep everything as we try to keep everything as lean as we can in most regards. Um, we The glass packaging was important. I'm not a huge fan of plastic, mm -hmm. period. Um, and the glass can be reused and we take those jars back at the farmer's market. So locally we'll take back the jars and reuse them, which is the best form of recycling, 100%. And we can do that and we can sanitize them, it's totally fine. Um, but a lot of the product that, that goes further away, we can't get back. And so, uh, but at least it can be sometimes recycled Hopefully people are reusing them to hold their paintbrushes and toothbrushes and things. Um, and then uh, and then we, yeah, we just do our best to minimize waste as much as we can. And we do recycle and compost and all that stuff. And then, and then idea, like hopefully there's less fuel going into the delivery of our ingredients because we're buying more local. Although we do sell for pretty far away um, because it's just, uh, it's really hard to run a consumer packaged goods business. You need the kind of economies of scale that are harder to achieve in a smaller region. Awesome, well, thank you so much. Um, the next question I have, and we've sort of uh, talked about this, is the, the place we find ourselves right now, COVID-19. Um, that on one hand, there have you know, um, been some, some good uh, outputs of that, that you know, you've been able to move forward on some of these more challenging when things are operating business as usual, um, but what are some of the challenges that you faced in the last, uh, it's gonna be close to a year probably when things hopefully start to go back to normal and how have you overcome that or anything, any new directions that you're taking because of it? Yeah, um, so the main impact on us was, uh, I pretty early came up with a plan and we divided the crew into two cohorts that weren't allowed to interact. And that way, that was just our insurance, internal insurance policy to make sure that if somebody did get sick and we had to quarantine for two weeks, that we would still have people to keep things going. Um, but that was really hard. And also they just didn't like it. Everybody like likes working together and suddenly we had to divide everyone up. And then we had these two disparate groups and um, it was challenging. So we did that for most of last year. We also offered hazard pay because it's a freaky time and everyone was having a little bit of a hard time. And then you have to wear a mask at work now on top of everything else. I mean, on the upside, we were already sanitizing everything because we're a food manufacturer. Um, we had pretty high standards of cleanliness already in place and people wore gloves all the time. So this was just adding a mask, but it's still, it was a, it was a hard year on people. And so, yeah, so I just felt like, and we were able to get some of the um, government loans for, uh, to support the business. And so I use that to do hazard pay and to cover the added expense of just working pretty inefficiently and having to spread, you know, some people were full time and we just couldn't, they had to, they, there was only three days available to each crew. And honestly, we didn't need all of those days all the time. So that was like a little bit of a drain on the business. Um, and there was, you know, in April, I think, was ridiculous sales because everyone freaked out and bought all the groceries everywhere. And so that, <laughs> and it was like, okay, that's cool. Um, but then it kind of leveled out. Um, so we had some, it was a roller coaster, I guess. But I'm pretty, and, and, you know, we lost all of our food service accounts for a while. And there's just been 
ups and downs. And we had to quarantine a few times. We had a few scares. Luckily, no one has gotten sick. Um, we had lots of check-ins. Uh, we've had, I think, three iterations of our COVID plan and try to like take everyone's, you know, it's like, a com it's a conversation to make sure that what we're asking both like feel safe enough and isn't overly stressing the people who mm -hmm. have to do all of the things. Um, and, and we got like, we're, min we're doing what is recommended um, by the, like the guidelines and everything. Um, so yeah, it was like a lot of extra work. It was like, if you were in college and then you have this extra class now to like learn about COVID and <laughs> like practices for that and how to like, and do all of that. And then we had all of the delays of like the jars not going off on time and some just truck, trucks weren't working normally. Things, no, things were weird. It was a weird year. Yeah. Did you, do you have any sort of lessons that you're going to take from this time and move forward in terms of, um, you know, building a more resilient system in or beyond your business? Um, you know, are there, are there things that sort of jump out to you that, that beyond your business too in the system itself, but in the local economy or support services? there are things that need to need to happen um, to to help businesses in the future when we come upon similar circumstances because this is not going to just be a one-time thing yeah well kind of like what i said earlier about the um like what i saw happen at the co-op when every when unfi in particular but a lot of the just the whole supply chain kind of took a meltdown um noticing that the areas that have like worked on local food resiliency like that really paid off like we had all the produce that we could have needed we had yogurt we had eggs we had sauerkraut we had you know like bread we even have dish soap here like in olympia like lacy you know so it was like cool that there were so many um i just and i think that that is because of people prioritizing that for a long time and that is a, just a tribute to the community and and like you know putting effort into kind of maintaining or rebuilding those systems because it has def there was you know culturally across the country there was a shift we used to all be regional because that was the only option and then it definitely went to a more cis like centralized system and i mean the food system totally but kind of everything and so just where we can it, it's about security like it is and i think it, you know even if we just talk about food like it is food security um the kind that is like, will we have it at all in the area? Um, if there were say, uh, if we ran out of oil or if another situation happened and interrupted the supply chain for any reason, like can, you know, are we building communities that are going to be able to sustain ourselves? And I think so much of this country can do so much within their own region. And there's so much benefit to that besides just having food. I mean, you have uh, like the, actually it's like terroir but like cultural terroir or whatever like there's just a lot of really cool aspects to that and a more diverse economy and different kinds of jobs for people to plug into where they might really find something that they can do that makes them happy i don't know there's a lot there and then <clears throat> on the other side just very micro at Oli Kraut is we because of the split crews we had to figure out how to communicate so much better. And so we ended up finding like apps and doing different things. And honestly, like we are way better off for that. And we have better systems in place to manage. I think it will make it easier for us to grow because now we've had to manage this like weird contortion that we didn't have to before. And now we've got it. And now we have those tools and it's like easier to run the business now that we're able to come back together. And so I feel like, and there's like a few examples like that where I feel like it was like, you know, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, I guess. So, right, right. Well, and it's, you know, um, interesting that you bring up this concept of cultural terroir. You know, one of the um, part of our students that are taking this course are actually also in our terroir merar program at Evergreen. And so um, thinking about the, the, um, the, the tastes of place. Um, and also, you know, that COVID has have forced people to um, to start cooking more, right? And to be more to their I know. What That's an opportunity um, as a business in the food system to engage in that, to see that change. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's exciting. I, I feel like it's, I think that it has improved a lot of people's lives because they, they had to develop some new skills and that's great. Or like rekindle the skills or something. So. Right. Exactly. Awesome. Um, so, you know, you've sort of given advice to to, um, to young people and students who, who want to be 
offers, right? That, um, you know, one of the things I sort of pulled out from the beginning of you when you talked talk about your journey was to just start, um, you know, to start small um, and to, uh, to experiment um, where you can, um, but also to stay organized. Do you have any other advice for um, would-be future entrepreneurs, um, people wanting to become business owners? Uh, well, I think, you know, it's really, it can be very exhausting. And I've heard it said that entrepreneurs are people who will work like 100 hours a week for the privilege of not having to work for someone else for 40 hours a week or whatever. And like, that's like kind of true. Um, but if you, what was my point? <laughs> there was something in there. Do you want me to throw my question again? I know. Well, yeah, what was, it was. There is the risk and then the starting. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That where you get your energy is from actually really caring about what you're doing and that that's how you can keep going. And that's how it's actually like fun and doesn't feel like you're working 100 hours a week. And hopefully you're not working 100 hours a week forever. But like the just like so I <clears throat> I came to the concept of a sauerkraut business after a, probably like I don't know, a pretty long process of like realizing that what I was doing with my life wasn't fulfilling and like kind of soul searching and thinking about what was actually a core, what were my core values and how can I like move towards things that would support those. And then out of that came all of these things that I was so excited about that I couldn't not do them. And like, yeah, I don't think I could still be doing this right now if I didn't actually care that much about the stuff that I'm doing and I think that that is actually that's like the most important thing because you're going to like burn it's so easy to burn out and I mean I have been burned out and I'm on verge right now I mean that happens but like serious like no I just don't want to do this anymore like you're just going to lose interest if it's not something that actually really matters to you and I love that idea um, and it's something that I advocate to for sort of when we think about sustainability or social business yeah, um, but everything needs to be connected to values, right? That um, in the core, when you think about, for example, your packaging, um, and if, if something that you care about is the environment, um, then that needs to be reflected not only in the products that you that you provide or the services that you provide, but also in sort of the packaging that you that you might use, right? Um, or yeah. um, the marketing that you use, um, or how you might engage. Um, you know, not only as an entrepreneur or a business owner, but as an advocate for a stronger local economy, right, in a variety of capacities. So um, thank you for, for, for lifting that as a, piece of a very valuable advice. Um, my, so I'm not going to keep you for much longer because you've given us some of your incredibly valuable time. Um, but my final questions are, um, how can we as community members support companies like yours, businesses like yours, and how can we, as community members, also support a growing local and regional food movement? Well, you can buy Oli Kraut. That's like the number one way to support our business. Um, and yeah, I mean, we just need to sell stuff. Uh, but that also, you know, but like as far as a regional food system, it's like think about where all your stuff comes from. Like think about not just your vegetables. I think we've done a really good job of communicating that and the amount of farmers markets that are around now are proof that we've like gotten through and people are like, I should buy my vegetables from the farmer. Awesome, definitely keep doing that. But like go beyond that and think of like if you're at the grocery store and you have a loaf of bread, like where was that bread made? Where did the wheat come from inside that bread? Um, and like your tomato sauce, like all, all of it, like think about all of those things, like take it a further, further down the line. And then if you can support products that are being actually made here and then beyond that coming from uh, produce and various other materials that are being produced here, that's going to actually make a really big difference. And I'm sure you guys have talked about the multiplier, the local multiplier and how circulating money through local businesses has a huge impact on the local economy. Like it's wild, the difference. Like if you spend your money at a locally owned coffee shop versus, I mean, Starbucks is a weird example because they're from Seattle, but they're really not a local business anymore. And so, <laughs> but yeah, so it, yeah, that, I would say that that's a, a big area to think about and then just engage and go to locally owned restaurants. And, you know, if, it's hard when you are a student and don't have a lot of money and says, 
like voting with your dollars isn't always an option, but there's usually ways to plug in anyway, and you still are buying food. Um, not everyone is, and but sometimes we have to just buy what's cheapest. There's times and that's totally chill. And I hope that we can keep keeping those options available. What would be really cool is if we could have really affordable, local quality food available for everyone. And I think that, you know, everybody's hopefully will keep chipping away at that problem. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. And before we go, I'm just going to share my screen. For those that are watching this video, um, I just want to um, highlight your website, um, you know, to find out more about um, where you can, oh, my computer is uh, struggling right now. <laughs> That's okay. It's funny. We're in the process of overhauling the website and making okay. a whole new one. So right now I'm like, oh, you're looking oh, at the old one, but <laughs> it's okay. It's all that's available right now. <laughs> um, but I can personally testify. I've had your products. They're absolutely delicious. So I just want to uh, to encourage everyone that sees this video to, um, to buy, support this incredible business um, and their important work that they're doing now and into the future. Um, Sasha, I want to thank you again for joining um, today and um, giving your valuable time in the midst of, of um, this challenging time. Um, you are an inspiration to many of, of people um, in Evergreen and beyond. So thank you very much. Well, thank you. And I'm so excited for this program and 